Welcome to Arts and Humanities Are Central. I'm Margie Morgan, Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at Central Washington University, and your host for this exploration of the important role that the arts and humanities play in our everyday lives. My guests today are two faculty members of the CWU's Department of Music, Nick Kuwili, Director of Orchestral Studies, and Gary Widenauer, Director of Choral Studies. Both are in their third year at Central, and both conduct two of our most well-known student ensembles, Nick, the CW Symphony Orchestra, and Gary, CW's Chamber Choir. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you, Dean Morgan. Let's start by having you talk with us about the student groups that you work with and your own musical talents and background. So, so Nick, uh, which student groups do you conduct and do you also perform as a musician? Uh, as you said, I, I do the Central Symphony Orchestra, which is the, the largest ensemble uh, at the music department. And I also do the Chamber Orchestra, which is a smaller version of the Symphony Orchestra. Um, and I also perform as a pianist, a uh, collaborative per pianist, with uh, members of the uh, music department. And uh, if I remember correctly, I, th I think you've also performed on some percussion instruments. Yeah, it's a small world. Um, <laughs> um, Mark Gutenberger, who's on faculty here at the music department, uh, he was my former percussion teacher. And just last year, we uh, collaborated on a uh, duet for marimba and vibes. And so it was a nice reunion. Wonderful. And, yeah. and Gary, uh, how many choirs do we have at Central? And um, what do you conduct? And what's your musical background? Well, we have five traditional choirs and three vocal jazz ensembles. And the choirs I conduct, as you mentioned, the CW Chamber Choir, which is the premier ensemble. And I also direct a men's choir. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a women's choir and a, what we call a y'all come choir, which is anybody can <laughs> sing who wants to. And we have a, a lab choir, which meets once a week, usually directed by a grad student. Um, my background is as a pianist and a singer. I've had um, done a number of operas, operettas, and, and um, played piano for, I guess my heyday was when I did the Rhapsody in Blue in college with the symphony orchestra. Wow. Uh, how many students are in the orchestra and how are they selected? This is a pretty large group. We have about 70 members in this orchestra. Strings, winds, percussion, brass. Um, uh, it's, it's a fantastic ensemble and uh, it's, uh, uh, we do about three concerts a year. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's, it's probably the, the, the best ensemble uh, in the music department. And, and how, how do you select the students? Uh, the students are selected by audition only. Mm -hmm. um, before the quarter begins in fall, we have them uh, play for us individually um, a number of excerpts that we've uh, predetermined. And they play by themselves and then um, after we hear all, um, every single string student, every single wind student, every single brass student, every single percussion student, Larry, uh, myself, Mark Lane, uh, uh, Gary Widener, we decide uh, the, con the content of our ensembles. Mm -hmm. And are the students mostly undergraduate students in the orchestra? Yeah, this is, is quite unusual. Uh, uh, our orchestra is made up of a c uh, completely uh, undergraduate students, which is quite unusual for a university uh, symphony orchestra. Usually you'll find members of the community, um, you'll find faculty members as part of the orchestra, um, graduate students. For us, it's, it's mainly uh, undergrads. And yet they often sound very professional, it seems to me. Yeah, this is the amazing thing. It's, it's, it's just a wonderful ensemble uh, of, uh, with such young students. It's, it's, it's a top-notch uh, music making. And, and Gary, the, the chamber choir, how many students in the chamber choir, and how, how do you go about selecting your ensemble? Well, um, I first want to take issue with the orchestra being the best ensemble <laughs> in the department. I think we have a lot of good ensembles. Um, basically, each year I kind of look around and see um, what the talent level is and instead of going to a certain number I'll kind of go to a certain standard and since I've been here the, the this is my third chamber choir to have created we've been anywhere between 26 and 35 and I could see it going up to 40 or 45 depending on the voices we have and so forth mm -hmm. um, like Nick and, and Larry we we have a pretty rigorous audition pro process which includes sight reading which would be seeing something they haven't seen before kind of um, me playing some patterns on the piano and them singing them back to me, which is called pitch retention, and some, some other uh, musical rhythms and, and other things that they do to, to make the ensemble. Now, are most students part of just one ensemble or, or, or more than one ensemble? How, how does that work? This is really the beauty of our department is that uh, our students are multi-talented. Um, a string student 
um, for example, might want to improve their sense of pitch. And uh, one great way to do this is to sing. And so I have plenty of string students that actually sing also in the choirs. And that helps their sense of intonation, um, helps them uh, with their own intonation on their own instrument. We mm -hmm. actually have in the choral part, I, I, I'm thinking of a student who plays bass in your orchestra. Mm -hmm. And he also sang in the vocal jazz group, which is one of the, one of the neat things about Central. But we'll probably talk about that a little bit later, I think. And, and what about, is, is there any advantage to doing this to the student? Is the nature of the music, choral music different from I, what I, they're I, looking at and when they're uh, in the symphony? I have found that, first of all, the, the more different um, ways you experience music, the better for you as a musician. But yes, um, a, a choir member will actually have the whole part in front of them. Those people that sing would know this, that the soprano, alto, tenor, and bass part are all in front of them, where in the orchestra, the, the clarinet player might not even see the whole clarinet part, but just the first clarinet part, where they're looking, it would be kind of like a play where you only had your lines, but nobody else is in your book. I see. So it's a little bit different. Interesting. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, we have uh, one major orchestra and one major chamber choir concert each quarter. That's mm -hmm. pretty much ha how, how it's gone. Um, how long from start to finish does it take to prepare the students for a, a major concert? Uh, with the orchestra, we have the, uh, the benefit of taking 10 weeks to put together a full program, uh, which is different from uh, professional orchestras that take four rehearsals only to put together a concert. And uh, I think this is to our advantage to have this much time, to a uh, gestational period, to produce a concert because we get to really unravel the nuances of, uh, say, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or Sibelius's Fifth Symphony, and mm -hmm. really come together and unify all our musical intentions to build to this, culminate to this uh, performance. And how many times a week will your orchestra get together? We rehearse twice a week as a full ensemble, um, and then we also rehearse once a week as a string ensemble. A string section needs, uh, because there are many string players that need to unify, say, bowings, articulation, intonation, uh, we take that one rehearsal to, uh, for strings only. Uh -huh. And then how many full dress rehearsals do you have? Just the one. Just one. Just one. And, and that <laughs> seems enough. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and um, how, about that? how about with the chamber yeah, choir? Yeah, chamber choir, the commitment that the students make is we rehearse five class periods a week, um, one hour on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and two hours on Thursday. And they have a one hour required sectional, which would be just the basses or just the tenors working together to learn their, learn things that just they need to be working on. And um, uh, sometimes we do have one concert a quarter, but ma many times there will be extra things. For example, this concert, this quarter we have the Halloween concert where we collaborate and then we have our choral concert, so it's really two different. And actually we host a festival, so that's three sets of concerts really. So. Mm -hmm. And how do you decide where to place the students? I noticed that that you know, when I'm sitting at a concert, uh, usually depending on which which piece they're playing or singing, they are moving all around and changing positions. And <laughs> how do you how do you decide on that? Well, you know, the the orchestra being <coughs> a sort of a heterogeneous um, medium, the string players, wind players, percussion players, you actually try to group them in families. And so often you have the strings in the foreground, <coughs> grouped from high voice down to low voice violins, violas, cellos, then to basses. And you have a woodwind family behind them, um, grouped also that way. And then the brass behind them mm -hmm. and the percussion behind, behind them. Usually sort of uh, group them so that uh, the more powerful instruments are behind because they can right. resound and the less powerful instruments are in front. And do you ever mix them up? Yeah, I, I try this as a, a pedagogical tool. Um, I, I consider the orchestra to be a very large chamber group. So just as a string quartet uh, works without a conductor and by listening to each other, I'll uh, practice um, having the 75 member orchestra work without a conductor and mix them up. And I'll put the tube over here, I'll put one violinist over here, I'll put percussion over here, and they'll be facing all sorts of different directions. And I'll say one, two, three, go, and they'll be, it'll be on them to create the music on their own. Wow. I think with, with a choir, it's, it's pretty much wide open. Um, as we were talking about the other day, um, if you take five people, 
they can literally stand in 120 different arrangements. That's the math factorial, five times four times three times two times one. Well, if you think of a 35 voice choir and start doing the math, 35 times 34 times, uh -huh. you know. Um, so there are literally hundreds of thousands of possibilities. Um, one of the things I do with the choir is I do change from, from piece to piece. Um, for example, if it's a fugue, which is polyphonic, where there would be melodies that happen in different sections, um, rather than having the sopranos all mixed in so that they might be singing the melody and it's coming at us from all over, I'd rather it come from there and then the next melody to come from there and so mm -hmm. forth. So that's one, one difference. The other thing is, just like Nick, there will be times where I'll have them stand in a circle and face out from yeah, each other. I've seen that. I've never seen that. Yeah. And no um, I'll say, you need to come in together. And they, they're, how do I do that? Well, figure it out. And <laughs> just like if you had a basketball hoop where you had a smaller hoop inside and then you took it away and the basket seemed easier to make, when they face inside to each other, like, wow, this is really easy, easy. to do now. So, Interesting. <laughs> well, I notice here that you brought some uh, batons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've never seen a baton before. Uh, <laughs> let me pick one up here. Um, I, I, I noticed from these that they're different lengths and different kinds. Uh, t tell me about the about the baton, what it's made of, and and, yeah. and why you use a particular baton as opposed to another, and what are you doing with it? Uh, you know, the baton is one of our tools. This is our instrument here, and. Uh -huh. And the, the, the shape and size and uh, style of the baton could be just about as individual as the conductor him, uh, himself or herself. Um, so they can be quite long, they can be quite short. Um, the shaft could be this white color or it could be um, a, a wood color. Um, uh, the, the handle right here could be any sort of shape, depending on your perf personal preference. Um, the one you're holding there, uh, Dean Morgan, is, is my personal preference. I like oh. that. Uh -huh. I like and, that and Why do you like this? So show, me, uh, show me how you hold it and why you like this. Uh, I, I tend to hold it um, right here in my hand, and I, I, I sort of grasp it like that. And I really consider the baton to be an extension of my arm. Uh -huh. And this is just another joint, uh, just like the elbow and the shoulder. Here's another joint, and and I, there's some conductors that hold the baton like this. There's some conductors that hold the baton like this. I know a conductor that holds the baton like a pencil, yeah, uh -huh. um, like this. But I, I prefer this because I, I I think visually it looks better because it looks like a, a, you know extension of your extension well, it's, of it's of interesting because I'm looking at yours and what you see on mine. This is my baton of choice. I've got my it's the it's worn off here because I hold it right in front. So you're a little about an inch or two in ahead of me on the baton. <laughs> but I also have a colleague um, who has um, tendonitis in her hand, and um, she actually had a baton uh, specially made so that it would extend, the bulb of the handle will extend into her hand as if um, like, a, like a, a gun handle or pistol. a <laughs> pistol handle. Huh. So um, it, this, it's all personal preference when it comes to batons.
what is the role of a conductor? It's interesting, um, you know, just bringing up the baton, this is only one piece of the puzzle, really. Uh, my philosophy about conducting is that I'm taking uh, the music, let's say, uh, where we have Beethoven, a Beethoven score here mm -hmm. that has all the parts. My job as a conductor is to, to digest all those black and white notes on the page and embody that and sort of manifest that physically. And um, uh, my philosophy is that the conductor is a conduit for music. So I'm gonna, if I'm going to conduct Beethoven, I'm going to fill up my body with Beethoven. If I'm going to conduct uh, Verdi, I'm going to fill up my body with Verdi, just as an actor fills up with Hamlet, with, uh, with uh, a, a comedic character. So, so you're really an actor as a conductor, and you're, you're uh, adopting certain uh, body language and facial expressions and uh, you know, form of energy depending on the piece, is that? Mm -hmm. Right, the, the, art, the art of nonverbal communication, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, using physical gesture to describe music, which is, uh, can be a very complicated thing or it could be very, very simple, but it tends to be very, very intuitive. Um, we all will do this, this means stop. And for musicians, this also could mean stop. If you want to encourage someone, you sort of, you offer a hand to them and offer them space. Um, uh, there are other expressive parts of our body that can communicate to musicians. Our eyes, I tend to think, are our most expressive uh, parts. And that can um, convey love, it can convey anger, convey um, uh, tenderness. It, tenderness yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I think also, I, w I was just reading a book before I came over here called In Quest of Answers, and it's a, it's a interview of about 15 or 20 choral conductors, and they were asking, what is a conductor? And many different responses, but many of them said, it's a communicator, it's a leader, it's a motivator. I find myself reading um, bi biographies of, of sports coaches, really, that, that kind of helps me with how to get to a goal. And, how to motivate and how to have good morale and how to have co a cohesive unit that's in front of you. And I think really what Nick said about nonverbal communication is you, you really are a communicator, but you're not a puppeteer. You're, you're not someone who's pulling the strings. I think a good conductor actually um, is somebody who takes all the energy up there and maybe, like you said, a conduit. It, it takes it into one place and pops it out to the audience. And a lot of people think that you're kind of pulling all the strings. If you're doing that, I think you're taking away a lot of what is expressive about music as a music maker. You need to feel free in your group to, to make music and not have somebody that you feel is uh, oppressing you or repressing you. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have the, the same piece of music and the same orchestra or the same choir, mm -hmm. but with different conductors, I guess what you're well, saying I, is the sound is going to be probably I've seen different? this happen with, with our groups. We'll have a different conductor come up and they sound different from person to person just on the same concert. But I think, um, you know, someone of a big physical stature might have a, a, a more, what did you say yesterday? More, a more gravitas. Yes. Yeah. So, so a 300 pound conductor uh, will, ha will make the ensemble sound very, very different from, a, say, a 100 pound conductor. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah. Our, our, we're given our bodies here, and so if I if I were get to get on the podium and conduct Mozart, um, I would pr tend to be more upwards like this. If the same playful. Uh, and playful, yeah. and if uh, the same music, the same ensemble, a 300 pound conductor got up and did the same thing, he would be, probably have to be a bit more light on his uh, on his feet to convey mm -hmm. Mozart. Well, you've both been in the uh, department now for two plus years. Um, do, do you think there's anything special or unique about Central's music department compared to other places that you've been? Well, I've actually taught um, or been involved with as a teaching assistant three, four other universities. And a couple of things strike me at Central. First of all, the cohesiveness of our faculty. Um, we have a supremely talented group of faculty who are also very eclectic and interested in a lot of different ways a lot of different performance media. Um, I'm thinking of Brett Smith who plays Baroque cello and then he plays banjo in a bluegrass <laughs> band, for example, or Hal Ott who does musicals in the summer and he plays Renaissance flute. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is the students that I, th in my groups, when I'm on stage with them, I feel a sense of pride and loyalty that I've not felt in any of the other four places I've been. It's uh, pretty palpable. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's really it's a sense of ownership of these ensembles from the students. Uh, the students really want to make uh, the performance great. And you know, after performances, I'll talk with students, and it, it's not about um, it's not about nailing a part individually. It's not about um, this one self. It's about being a part of that group and being a part of something bigger than themselves. And um, uh, that's a really special thing here at, at Central. And there's not a lot of competition between the different areas and the departments. Well, it's a, it's a healthy. Um, it's it's a competition in the sense that when my choir's up there and they watch like on 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 the Halloween concert that we collaborate on, they'll watch the orchestra and they'll go, "These guys are really good," and so that makes them want to get out and be really good as well. So it's that kind of competition rather than you know backstabbing or or kind of you know unhealthy. I I think. It's wanting to do well because your colleagues are doing well. Right, and I, I see students all the time reaching out to each other and say, oh, you, you know, I, you're having trouble with that part. Let's work together to okay. get that better. Mm -hmm. Let's work together to get that better. Let's make sure our, the, our flutes and oboes match in terms of intonation. Real sense of uh, building from the ground up. I think it, it also has a little bit to do with us as faculty because we, we collaborate well together and we all kind of give. You know, I'd love to have another three, four hours a week rehearsal. So would you, I'm sure. but. <laughs> we realize that, that if we give a little bit, everything can be better. And I think, you know, unlike some schools where you say they have a great orchestra, they have a great choir, we, you, you go to Central and you say, jazz, orchestra, band, choir, they're all at a, at a mm -hmm. high level. And have you had some, some major collaborations recently? Yeah. Oh, really ambitious endeavor. Last spring, uh, Gary and I put together uh, with VJ um, in the chorale. VJ Singh, my choral sing. colleague. Uh, we put together uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, wow. and this is this is a very mature work, mm -hmm. and for uh, the 100, 150 members of the choir and the seventy musicians of the symphony orchestra and four paid soloists and four uh, guest soloists, uh, what a fantastic endeavor! Um, and we it really uh, it came across very well. <laughs> remember that concert and there were people coming out of there crying. It was so incredible. So these collaborations are obviously wonderful and, and, and I too think that's a very special thing about our, mm. our department. What, what's typically your most fun collaboration during the year? Well that was a serious, the Beethoven was very serious, but we, we typically do a, a Halloween concert, sold out two concerts, one for the school children and one for the community. And, you know, Nick and I, have, this is our, uh, we've done a couple of these already, and we, we find that this is one of our, our most fun That's things, right. and, and we just have the same idea of what an audience will like and the same kind of sense of humor, and, 
you know, we have everything from the Simpsons spider pig to uh, who were you last year? Who'd you dress up as? I dressed up as Mr. Incredible last year. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you've got the kids all in costumes. And, and we, we actually, there's a surprise at the end where a couple of Star Wars characters usually get into a battle while they're singing and playing and so forth. So. Well, un unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, Nick and Gary, thanks for joining us. I look forward Thank to many more here. concerts and collaborations. Uh, thank you for tuning in. For additional information on our concerts and recitals, please consult our Department of Music website. See you next time on Arts and Humanities, our central. <laughs>